pray now, Lord, since you are here in the form of the Holy Spirit, you will teach us the way of eternal life, the secrets that Ebenezer to this end time, Lord, anoint us we might speak truth, O oh God, and ears hear truth, Lord. We all be in the truth, Father. We're just relying upon you now and bless us in Jesus' name. Pray, man, you may be seated. Um, this, of course, is number 11 of the future home, and uh, concerning this message, it appears to me that its relevancy to this hour lies in the fact that we are an end-time bride who is fast approaching its predestinated manifestation of the thoughts of God. Now, you understand, of course, we're saying here that this message has to be relevant somehow to this hour, to the bride of the hour, <clears throat> and um, this bride must be near the predetermined manifestation of the plan or the thoughts of God. The major concern of God is a bride in his own image, and with bodies that are like unto the body of his glory. And that's what God had in mind, all the families of the earth be united, and all in his image, and all with that glorious body, all alike. Now this end time bride, while still a living, is about to receive its change to immortality. This hasn't happened for 2,000 years. <clears throat> the shadow or negative is all but gone. You realize Brother Branham placed his hand and the light shone in his hand and he said, you notice how the hand comes closer. There's less and less shadow until there's no shadow at all. And you see exactly the form as it is to be. Uh, the shadow may fool you for some time, but the closer you get, the closer you begin to see the proper form. So the shadow or negative is all but gone because we're all soon be immortal. Thus we are a bride that is only moments from its ultimate, which is to be priests and kings unto God and reside in the new Jerusalem. Now let us understand this clearly. <clears throat> the ultimate <clears throat> or true manifestation of anything whatsoever must have had already within its life source that which alone would be responsible for that ultimate manifestation, no matter when or under what conditions it took place. Now, I want to read that again because it's very important to understand that that's a process of life in action, the ultimate or true manifestation of anything whatsoever. <clears throat> in other words, you're talking any form of life whatsoever must have had within it already, it's already in those within the life source itself, and it's that which alone would be responsible for the ultimate manifestation, no matter what conditions it would go through, uh, or ever, whatever took place. And I hope you get the picture there, because what you're looking at is the genetic pattern uh, based upon the spiritual, so that whatever lies there must be manifested, and uh, whatever is there will be manifested because it's already in the genetic pattern. Mm -hmm. Now, any change or series of changes that may be required for the ultimate had to have been programmed within the original life. Mm -hmm. All things work together for good. That series if it's in a series, then most of the time it is. Uh, steps to the, the series of steps, this, that series of steps to the ultimate is the foreknowledge, election, and predestination in that order. And that's in all nature as well as in the individuals. And in no way could there be a switch or an upgrading or a downgrading. The purpose of God being a glorified family within God's own gradation, that's, that's of status, was ironclad by God. Now let me go through that again. And in no way could there be a switch or an upgrading or a downgrading. Now I know that you're looking in terms say, well, man was downgraded. And, and man's going to be upgraded. No, you're missing it. Whatever was programmed will be. And it doesn't matter if you went 
through a series of reincarnations. That was God's plan. You would get an ultimate. So what you're looking at, <clears throat> you're looking at God's foreknowledge was God's ultimate <clears throat> before there was ever a speck of stardust. God was going to do it. So there could be no downgrading, upgrading, or any change. Now, Brother Branham mentioned the seed cannot change. The purpose of God being a glorified family with God's own gradation, that's his own cosmos of status, was ironclad by God. So here's what I'm saying. This kingdom of kings and priests unto God is a reality that we already have within us by programming the genes, qualitative and quantitative, would one day come forth. And geography and time <clears throat> has nothing to do with its plan, its inception, its finalization, except that it enhances it. So let that sink in. you never understand how all things work together for good and how it is that the sovereignty of God, and God being what he was, it was necessary he predestinated a sinner in order to bring salvation, give himself reason and purpose and meaning. So saying again, here's what we're saying, based on what we've learned. This kingdom of kings and priests unto God is a reality that we already have within us. In geography and time, <clears throat> and the conditions of the vessels, it has nothing to do with this plan, its inception, its finalization, except all these things will enhance it, such as struggling and striving and suffering with him to glorify. You'll be greater glorified. It is a case of all things working together. So we are already kings and priests unto God in the spirit, and shortly it shall be manifested that that is exactly right. Now our thoughts on this came from paragraph 272 and page 59. And there we saw how kings act in the New Jerusalem. Life there is one great continuous atmosphere of peace, and there is a constant manifestation of peace going on, even to the extent of a ritual. Thus my thought was one wherein I see we are so close to immortality that the negative should be all but gone <clears throat> as we rally round <clears throat> the last day word that our lives should be lives of peace and extending peace. Remember Nixon's Dirty Trick Gang? How many Dirty Trick Gangs we got here tonight? Now, if you get hit tonight and Sunday, don't blame me. I'll be hit the same as you. We won't get you too much at this point. But you cannot tell me, and I cannot tell you, and I will be told by nobody, and I will tell nobody different what the prophet said. The closer you get to the end time, or you place your hand, as he did against the wall, the light shining on the hand, the negative becomes more and more to the positive. Then there should be less and less differentiation and delineation of any kind between the real and the shadow. Now that's what we are talking about. A lot of it has had to do with wrong teaching. <clears throat> A lot of it has to do with no sanctification, no responsibility. But we are far cry to manifest in the reality that we've got hardly a quarter inch of time to go if we've got that. Okay. So, rallying around this word, and we're speaking in terms of logos and rima both, our lives should be lives of peace and extending peace to everybody, every opportunity. And the opportunity is, law, is there 
always there as long as we meet even one person. <clears throat> For that person can always be met. Now listen with what Brother Branham said many times people, with a welcoming spirit. That's the first step, a welcoming spirit. Now, you don't have to put the person in your bosom if he's a rat or a snake, but the welcoming spirit should be there on every occasion. A choice example <clears throat> of this is the type of Abraham and Melchizedek. Remember the first time we deal with Melchizedek in Hebrews 13.8 is when he appeared with two others, two angels. Abraham welcomed him, immediately ran to meet him. And then we notice at the time of the battle, after Abraham had gone to war to bring back Lot, his children and their possessions and so on, he met the king Melchizedek. He was the king of peace, the king of righteousness. He had a welcoming spirit. And you'll notice that Melchizedek <coughs> served Abraham. And of course, that was God in the form of a human being. Now, we'll look at a couple of scriptures here concerning this peace we're talking of in this end hour. And stating just a few, like John 14 and 27, he said, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth give I unto you, that not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. In other words, there is no fear <clears throat> at any time to manifest peace or to receive peace or to work to that end. Again, in John 20, verse 19, then the same day at evening, and it's closing up time now, being the first day of the week, and we're ready to go. We're talking of the first day again, all over the eighth day, you know. When the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus, stood in the midst, and he said unto them, Peace be unto you. And in 21, Jesus said again, Peace be unto you, as my Father sent me, even so send I you. And again in 26, after eight days, again his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst, <coughs> and said, Peace be unto you. And you see, it's a kingdom of peace that we're dealing with, and so, therefore, there should be great peace within the camp of God, <clears throat> which camp, of course, is without, is outside the camp of the unbeliever. And then in Romans 14 and 19, let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace. <clears throat> Do the things that bring harmony, equilibrium, and cause people to be at rest rather than those things which cause the opposite. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace. Doesn't just say now we want you to be peaceful and we want you to uh, extend peace to people. It says to literally cultivate an atmosphere whereby peace may reign in the house in which you live, the community and especially the household of God. That is, therefore, follow after the things which make for peace and things wherewith one may edify one another. There's nothing worse than unrest and distrust to tear people down, so we should cultivate uh, programs and ways of bringing up faith and rest, get the rest of faith. You see, now, in James, <clears throat> the third chapter, it mentions in verse 18, and the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. You'll notice what it says here. And the fruit of righteousness. Many times we find churches are not bearing righteous and good fruit. What is the matter? Why is there not more manifestation? <clears throat> because the people are not practicing sowing in peace. 
Now it says the fruit of peace is sown in peace. If you want a peaceful, loving Christian society, a community, a real family of get-togetherness, what we're looking for, it says the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace. As long as there's peace, <clears throat> there won't be these untoward things come forth. Many churches have them, and of course, it's a bad situation. We want to get to the place where we are as calm as a mill pond in the sense that we have that calmness, but we are swift running waters in the sense that the move of the Spirit of God is amongst us. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace <clears throat> of them that make peace. Blessed are the peacemakers, of course, where they shall see God, and so on. Now, if one reads the Pauline epistles continuously, you will find grace and peace be unto you through our Lord Jesus Christ. And I would suggest that it is the grace of God at this time that has brought himself down in our midst, a very imperfect people, such as described by God himself, as to be highly immoral, wretched, miserable, blind, and naked, and don't have the brains to know it. You know, in fact, they'd have so little brains, they even crow about it. We don't have that problem here in that respect. <clears throat> We're looking at the fact that in this hour the God of all grace has come down, and that the peace, of course, then is manifested with it. So, all right, one more verse of Scripture is in 2 Peter, <clears throat> where we are speaking of this great event to come, the dissolving of the world and the atmospheres, and then everything coming back purified. It says here then in the third chapter of 2 Peter, Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy behavior and godliness? Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall meet, melt with the fervent heat. <clears throat> now, of course, that address was fine to the people of the first church age, and they were looking 2,000 years down the road to where we are. So, therefore, they're literally addressed to us, is what you're really contemplating. The address is to us. And notice how it puts it there. We who understand these things and know this to be the truth. See? It said, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God. That great day when the heavens will be on fire. The elements shall <coughs> melt with the fervent heat. <clears throat> then it says to those people there, what, what kind of people ought we to be? Well, it says to you and me, as it never said to them, because that wasn't to them. That is to us. See? Now, it says here, what, what kind of people ought we to be contemplating that day and we are contemplating it. See, now everybody else is contemplating it a thousand years from now, like the white throne. We do not contemplate that a thousand years now. We contemplate it now. Amen. And it must have a salutary effect upon us. <clears throat> it must have something that is exceptionally good for us. Now, nevertheless, we, according to his promise, <clears throat> look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Now, it is very obvious, then, that it is only those people who are in this element, in this atmosphere, and you cannot have it unless it was in you from the beginning. Yeah. See what we're talking about? Yeah. You couldn't have it. <clears throat> then these people must be caught up in this. Now, watch. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you and nobody else is looking for these things. Now, a lot of people say they are, but you talk to them and say, White Throne is now, <clears throat> uh, and just skip the thousand years. The message is not premillennial or millennial. The message is eternal. Time and eternity have come together. Mm -hmm. One day is only a thousand years. Brother, sister, listen to me. The minute the dead come out of the grave, time is gone. You don't have a clue about time. You'll be living in the essence for a thousand years, but you are traveling in eternity. And nothing 
is measured anymore by the roll of a planet or the rising of the sun, though it'll be there. You will have been inculcated into the completion of the plan of Almighty God. Even as He became flesh, we become literally entirely spirit. He transferred entire spirit to the flesh and lived it. We, we transfer entire flesh to the spirit and live it. Because you're brand new. <clears throat> now, because you are looking for this, wherein dwelleth righteousness, wherefore though seeing that you look for such things, be diligent that you be found of him in peace. Without spot and blameless, an account of the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our brother, beloved brother Paul, also according to wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. As also in all his epistles, speaking of, in them of these things, in which some, are some things hard to be understood, which they uh, that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they also do other scripture, under their own destruction. In other words, they don't know the doctrine. So they quote, 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 fabricate, fabricate, mess up, mess up, and they all die. <clears throat> they never go to heaven. They can't do it. Because they quote themselves plumb out of, out, of, out of existence into the lake of fire. Yeah. You therefore, beloved, seeing you know these things, before, beware, lest you also being led away the error of the wicked. What's the first error of the wicked? Well, Eve got into it by turning her mind over to Satan, and you saw what Cain did. He worshipped in self-will. And fall from your own steadfastness. Now, then, now he's talking of individuals lost, but grow in grace, and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now he said here, Where, well, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent, that you may be found in him without spot, and you are really <coughs> blameless. And that's exactly what P what James says. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. <clears throat> so we were drawing a lesson here, the relevancy especially of this message, applying it to the end time. And we are just literally a hair's breadth away, if we're that much away, from the literal immortality that shall come upon us. And then there's nothing but New Jerusalem, because we are New Jerusalem people once more geographically, not misplaced, but growing. And you'll find that Brother Branham calls the millennium a time of further sanctification. So you keep that in mind. All right, <clears throat> let's read then, again on page 59. And it says, the leaves will be for the healing of the nations, that is, the kings that live in there bring their honor in. When they bring their honor in and lay it before the throne of God, just in the type of how the eleven tribes would bring in their substance, the tithe to the Levites who would live by it. They bring their honor in that blessed land, then they'll reach for the tree of life and break off a leaf of the tree, and they'll walk out together. There's no more war, everything's at peace. <clears throat> the leaves are for a memorial for the healing of the nation. So therefore, peace is such a tremendous thing that all through the eternity, you will find a memorial and the taking off of the leaf. Now, I cannot say, because I don't remember Brother Branham having said it, he might well have said it as, uh, as theologians say, <clears throat> that when the dove clicked off the olive leaf and brought it back, it was significant of the cutting off of Jesus as the peace offering in order that the people may land safely and be in safe conduct after their safe passage, <clears throat> representing this is what is procured for you. That could well be what we're looking at here, because remember, Jesus is always spoken of as the Lamb, and the Lamb is truly sacrificial. I suppose Brother Branham has mentioned that with the, with the theologians. I just can't remember him having said it. I don't know if he would even say it, but many say it, and I think it has a lot of merit when you look at that. <clears throat> it's also then in this hour when you realize and contemplate the fullness of the value of the blood of Jesus Christ, how that blood is now uh, dealing uh, for us in such a marvelous way, then certainly then peace like a river should flow, and at all costs we should be negotiating peace, <clears throat> sowing peace, 
and doing everything we can in order to bring in a peaceful spirit. And of course, that distinctly means like the plucking off of the leaf. It means a cessation from the position it once held and saying, I no longer hold the position. Now, look, we could talk about this for a long, long time, but you all know we have unrest in our hearts. As Brother Brown has said, and everybody says it so clearly, we can forgive, but we can't forget. But in the position of not being able to forget, we can always remember then that we are in a position to forgive and to do something about it. So nobody expects anybody here, and myself included, to suddenly blank out. Because I just, I wish I could blank out. I've often thought it'd be nice if I could just die and wake up and be somebody else. I've given that up. <laughs> you can't be childish about these things. So I'm not trying to put something on you so we're going to conduct some classes here and you're suddenly going to evolve into something you aren't and you have no hope of being. Forget it. But the point is this, <clears throat> that these kings knew what to do. And they held forth the olive branch which signified peace and victory. In other words, I have the victory. I don't have to live in the scum or the morass of my own uh, turgid thinking. But I can live in peace, and I will live in peace by the grace of Almighty God. <clears throat> not to have doubts and fears and, and, and wonderments. I have, I have plenty myself. It is just not, it is not compatible with his life. It is not compatible. <clears throat> it's not what we should have at this time. We're too far down the road. According to the scripture which I am reading, and according to what Brother Brown said, and if he was indeed the same prophetic caliber, even far greater than Peter, because Peter was not really a prophet. No, he just said the things that he knew. But William Branham in the caliber of Paul, knowing these things and saying these things, bears down very heavy upon our hearts, minds, and lives. All right, now, like Adam, he said, there was a tree of life in the Garden of Eden that he might have eaten from if he hadn't fallen. Well, just too bad. He went he should have gone to the tree of life first. Mm -hmm. He just let us sit there. And so he didn't get any help. That tree of life reminded him all the time that his youth was continually going on. <clears throat> all right? So, let's go over here to Revelation chapter 22, and you're going to really love this chapter the same as I do. I know you're loving it already. Where it says in verse 10, he said, the book is no longer sealed up. It's a bit done been open to us. Mm -hmm. Don't you dare seal the prophecy. The time is at hand. He that unjust is unjust ill. <clears throat> old Abel's is just. And old Cain is unjust. Cain is filthy. Abel is, is not filthy. Uh, Cain is unrighteous. Abel is righteous. Abel is holy. Cain is unholy. There you are. Behold, I come quick, and my reward is with me. Dear man, according to where it should be. I'm the alpha to make me the first to, la first to last. Blessed are they that wash their robes. You're right up then to... to, to uh, Ephesians, the fifth chapter, <clears throat> the bride is being washed by the washing of the water of the word, which cleanses away all her filth. Uh, Revelation 3, 3, 14, 17 in there. She's no longer in her adulterous, rotten rags anymore. Now watch. For that they may have the right to continue as youth. <clears throat> they may gaze upon their form, which is beginning to form by the Holy Spirit moving in the bodies of the people that are the bride. <clears throat> you have a right <clears throat> to ponder <clears throat> your youth. Brother Branham couldn't stand wrinkles. And he couldn't stand the thought of old age. And he took out the youngest and most handsome picture of himself and me. And he had him enlarged and put him up where everybody could see him. And he'd go home and she'd put it face down or tailor. He'd say, why do you keep doing that? Climbed up the attic to get him. <clears throat> Finally, he said, look it, I want those pictures left there. There is a purpose in what I'm doing. We look like that once, we're going to look like it again. Amen. What's bad, you people? <laughs> You're stupid as I am. <laughs> Get out the young pictures. That pretty looking boys and girls here. Don't bite your finger out there, but you... <laughs> You're pretty, you don't worry about them. <laughs> You're a pretty girl. You're going to be pretty. Bigger. Look in the mirror and you go home. You're going to be pretty all your life. Man alive. Handsome boys here. <clears throat> yes, there's a purpose. Brother Brown.
Branham took the picture then. Well, that's that's the word of God. That's some hogwash somebody can invent. Yeah. The tree of life <clears throat> signifies a perpetuation of you. And until you get kind of creepy, slight, slightly creepy, or creepy behind the eyeballs, I'm going to say this with the utmost authority. You're just as youthful at 150 if you still got what's behind your eyeballs as you are 10 years of age. Mm -hmm. Only you're a whole lot smarter. We're entering a realm <clears throat> where we don't need to worry anymore about what's behind the eyeballs, Alzheimer's disease or anything else, or lack of glutamine, some of those things that bring you down. You don't have to worry about whether you drag your feet or you have a foot to drag, because this is the hour of perpetuation. The youth going on. And there is a thought here that our youth is going on because there's no such thing as youth or old age in God. Mm -hmm. It is just the fact that the little bit of the tenure in this mortal vessel makes it a little bit blotchy. Other than that, it's very good. Looking at the tree of life in this hour then means our youth is going on. Don't look to get older, look to get younger. See, same with the nations. <clears throat> the leaves will be for the healing of the nations. <clears throat> Notice, not sickness now. Immortality doesn't have anything to do with sickness. Immortality has to do with complete blasting the old molecule. Mm -hmm. Sickness in getting better is hopefully you'll grow some new tissue. That is the same tissue that you've got will be regrown in the sense what's now defunct. Hey, we're going to get brand new substance, brother and sister. <clears throat> Don't have to worry about that. This is not this is not healing. We're talking about this immortality, not the sickness. Now he'd have the same rights that Adam did, like the dove with the holly leaf. Each king taking a leaf. See the prodigal, the ritual, never to ever be dismissed. Then how great is this great peace that God gives? Notice the river of life. <clears throat> Perhaps many little, many little streams making it up. We never thought of that, did we? We all kind of got a stereotype picture in our mind about a holy city, which didn't seem too appealing. Made out of solid gold, and who needs it? There's a great big river there, and great big old trees, roots across it. And here you think, say, man, that's a funny looking place. I don't know if that really matches up to my idea of what beauty is. Well, now the prophet brings it out into a a semi-rural urban district <clears throat> with vistas and parks, as he describes here, and then many little rivers making up this, little, this bigger river, like seven church ages making up one great flow, until now all of the Holy Spirit is here. <clears throat> one at, <clears throat> last day manifestation, God himself in the midst of the church. In this life, I have never seen anything so thirst-quenching as to be in the mountains and find, as I preached the other night, that stream bubbling up. It's a life-giving resource. Now, it doesn't say source. He said it's a resource, and that's good. You'd be tired and thirsty. <clears throat> Fall down by a good stream. Way down where germs can't go. Way down hundreds of feet in the earth is bubbling forth pure, genuine, life-giving water. We appreciate that. That's just... A little thing, of course, <clears throat> what you're looking at here. Uh, there's a theory, of course, I've told you before that if the water goes down into the crust of the earth and gets way down there, it hits the, the solid, the heat where the lava is molten, and then that just hits the water, makes it pure steam. And at one time, there wasn't all the pesticides and the gunk in the earth we got now <clears throat> through the evil of mankind. The water came up with pure water, beautiful water picking up the minerals that came along, making it wonderful drinking water. Well, uh, that's a life-giving, it's not a life-giving source, but it's a resource that contributes to the life. <clears throat> now, Brother Branham said this river here, although river of life is not life itself, you already got it, 
but as one of the great resources of the life itself, which is God. Evidently, it's symbolic, or at least we can look at it that way for the time being. 275. Now, the earth has its many streams with refreshing water. There have been seven streams over the seven church ages. When you're thirsting and dying, uh, you get a good drink of cold water that'll help, that will help you live. <clears throat> but look where this one comes from, from the throne. There's where it gets its life-giving resources. It comes from under the throne of God where God sits. So he's crediting God, who is the source of all life, with this great resource which he gives us. All right, let's just take a little look in here. Uh, maybe we'll swing back to Matthew chapter 28. Brother Brown would like to quote this one <clears throat> to us, 10 to 12, where precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here to go there, though. For stammer lips another tongue would he speak this people to whom he said, this is the rest because the word rest. This is the refreshing, yet they would not hear. <clears throat> All right. You've got the word of God there, and the people didn't want to hear it. Now, let's go back to John. <clears throat> chapter 7, <clears throat> and you look at um, 37, 39, the last day, the great day of the feast. <clears throat> now, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him unto me and drink. <clears throat> so Jesus stands in the feast of the tabernacles, and he said, If any man is thirsty, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has says, and in no other way, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Now, <clears throat> you put this, Brother Branham said, this is the seventh church age, and this is the Feast of Tabernacles. Then we find Jesus back here, in the book of Revelation, <clears throat> the third chapter, speaking on the great day of the last feast. And he said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if any man hear my voice and open the door, I'll come in and sup with him and he with me. <clears throat> and him that overcometh. Well, I grant to sit with me in my father's throne as I've set my throne as I've set down, overcome and set down in my father's throne. And over here. In the 22nd chapter of Revelation, after the book is open and the great separating by the word, which was handled by the word or the Logos handling the Rima through the prophet comes on the scene. Verse 17, the spirit and the bride say, come, let him that heareth come, now let him that is a thirst come, whosoever will let him take of the water of life freely. Here you have in this end time of the perusal of the great new heavens and new earth and the new Jerusalem, you find the giving of the substantial water of life in this hour where people now have life-giving resources as they've never had it before. He said it cuts from under the throne. And Jesus said, I am sitting on my Father's throne. And you have these resources here <clears throat> to give you a refreshing. And remember that refreshing is precept upon precept. It is the Word of God coming, as Brother Branham said, you receive the fullness of the Holy Spirit, piling word upon word, until you have a genuine baptism with the Holy Ghost. That is a life that is absolutely full of the life of Almighty God. Now, God is sitting on this throne here, and he's the great creator. So it signifies the life and the power, the constant creatorial power of the great creator in magnificent display. All of this earth, this here in which we live now, every one, whether it be a Christian or pagan religion, have temples. Do you ever think of that? Churches, all of them. This one doesn't have any. New Jerusalem has no temple. Millennium has one, this doesn't. The Bible said there was no temple in it. Because the Lamb is the light. <clears throat> now, in Revelation, again, 22, you'll notice in there, in 17, the Spirit and the Bride say, Come. In other words, they're absolutely one with Almighty God at the end time. 
<coughs> invitation to take the water of life freely, and that is the great temple. In other words, now you must consider the fact that you have God himself as our own holy temple without having taken on the manifestation that it will take on or he will take on 1,000 years from now. Yes, by tomorrow morning at the wedding supper, you're looking at it. You're not looking down the road. No way, shape, and form. So neither are you looking at this as though you need to look at a temple. I think that's one reason I hold so lightly any church building. <clears throat> It'd be nice to get a nice building which is convenient, commodious, those things, but I have no respect for it, to be honest with you. I think if it's a billion dollar temple, I'm not interested. Because if God is not there and God can be found in some old barn, <clears throat> rat infested, and we've been in those too, I'd just soon be there. In fact, a whole lot more be there than someplace else. So you're looking at what the true temple is. You're looking beyond yourself as a temple of the Holy Ghost. You're looking at the true temple where all the light is and all the life is and everything that comes out of the great creator. You're looking at it now because we even got his picture. Now, you might not want that. You might not believe it. That's fine by me. It just shows you you don't believe what we teach you. You don't believe what the prophet teaches. Because you've got your crazy ideas back there somewhere that you've got an idea you know something. Well, be my guest to know something. I'm tired of these men to know something. They may be sick. What do they know? They can't even cure a hangnail. Listen, I'm going to tell you something. It's hard enough to even believe a vindicated prophet without listening to the brains of the scrapings of an asshat. You're just getting the scrapings of an asshat today, not even the asshat. Brother Brandon said the theology is so poor, it's made out of the soup of the shadow chicken to start with. <coughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. My sarcasm is not biting enough. Stick around a while. The lamb is the light, and the lion is the temple. Why he says that, I don't know, but he says it. Perhaps it means that the lamb is the light, <coughs> uh, light coming out of the resurrection power that's here, <clears throat> and the lion being the temple, in other words, showing forth in manifestation of power, I don't know. I can't tell you. <clears throat> uh, it may be that it has to do with the lion face. You're looking at the age of the prophet that is the eagle, but it's reverted back to the lion. In other words, the lion of God is on the scene, God demonstrating, manifesting his power, vindicating, so that the prophet has the right to speak. I don't know. <clears throat> But to make it relevant, I would say that is a fairly good thought. John saw <clears throat> the one on the throne Revelation 5, 1 to 7. You can take a look at that. Might have some thoughts in it. I don't know, but just look at it. I saw on the right hand of him who sat on the throne a book written within and on the back side, seal with seven seal. <clears throat> and uh, saw a strong angel proclaiming a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book? And loose the seals, who's big enough to do it? Who's strong enough to do it? Because this book is mighty bound. No man in heaven nor on earth or under the earth is able to open the book, even look thereon. Now it must, because no man was found worthy to open the read the book or look thereon. One of the elders said, Weep not, and behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, that prevailed, opened the book <coughs> and loosed the seven seals. And he looked and he saw a lamb. <coughs> so you could now begin to see, if you cared to see, the same life in two forms. One is lamb, which is significant of the death, the uh, remittance of sins, the opening of the door for the Holy Spirit. And then you see a lion come forth, and a lion always signifies power, <coughs> always signifies strength and ability, <coughs> showing vindication, vindicative properties. So in this hour, 
<clears throat> again, we see vindication. We see all these things. And we know that we are part of the eternal city because we recognize. Mm -hmm. Now remember, the oxen recognizes his master's crib. The birds in the air know their pattern and their nest, but the people of God don't know their God. So therefore, when the people know their God, and they know him correctly, then they are correctly identified by the instinctual, essential nature of God within them. Right. No other way. <clears throat> See, all these temples have an object they're worshiping. They got idols and so on. But in this city, he is the object. He's with his people. Again, I want you to notice that is Ephesians 1, 19 to 23. <clears throat> the unveiled God. In other words, he is not veiled. And he can only be apprehended when he is veiled because the veiled apprehends him or declares him or explains him. <clears throat> so, at this point, he is unveiled in our midst. They caught the veil there, but only a camera or a prophet could catch it. All right. That one is in our midst. And that one is going to be above the throne in the new Jerusalem and the new heavens and the new earth. And he's here now. And we are fully acquainted with the phenomenon. Because people couldn't even ask William Branham the question, and he answered the question. Before they call, he answers. <clears throat> we are in touch with and have seen the consummation of revelation of the one into whose presence we shall bring whatever glory we are allowed to bring to his grace and his goodness by having allowed us to be a part of it. Because always the wife gives back to the husband ministered him what he has given her. <clears throat> also remembers Hebrews, the second chapter. In the midst of these people, he sings praises unto God, and he said, these are mine. In other words, he authenticates them. Even today, we have the same authentication. 277, his spirit light floods the pyramidal city. In other words, it is a, it is a spiritual light. It is an emanation. It is an outrage. It is from what is within him. The glory of God and the Lamb. <clears throat> God himself shall be that light. Now, Brother Branham mentions, continuously, we'll walk in the light. And we know, of course, that that light is over here in 1 John. <clears throat> this is the Alpha, and we are in the Omega <clears throat> of the first of that, of that great light. And he said, that which was from the beginning and so on, we've handled of the word of light. Where the life was manifested. Now you know life itself is inscrutable. It cannot be seen. <clears throat> People take a, a high-powered microscope and they see little spiral sheds and little tiny things that you have to have a tremendously high-powered microscope to see them. What, you, what they see is not life. What they see is movement caused by <clears throat> the life manifested in a material form. But life itself is spirit and is absolutely inscrutable. <clears throat> it cannot be seen. But he said we have it. Number three, that which we have seen declaring to you, that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father, with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write unto you, that your joy may be full. This then is the message which you heard him declaring to you, that God is light. And in him is no darkness at all. So therefore, the more fully identified you are with your father, the less you will have of darkness. Mm -hmm. And this bride at the end time will be 100% light. And being 100% light, God will be duty bound, therefore, to put her into the same body as Jesus. Mm -hmm. Read it over. Yeah. Amen. You don't think that light is going to get this light. Light is light. Like father, like son. <clears throat> See? All right. If we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. This is a time of full light. Full light brings full walk. All right? If that's not the new Jerusalem, 
outside is true and better geographical situation, I want to know what I'm talking about. Once more, you have the relevancy. You're not looking down the road, brother, sister, to arrive. I don't preach that kind of message. But that's not what God has given me by the prophet. My message is the prophet's message. You don't look back, you don't look forward, you look now, and you see what is now. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> if we walk in the light, you see the light. We have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us. There you are again. Once more, the tie post of the word allows us to proffer the olive branch under every consideration, <clears throat> or to take the word from the tree of life. That's why your constant talking together is a good thing. <clears throat> How can you be disadvantaged one to another if you're talking the same word? Now, you've lost some of your diligence, and I feel it up here, and you feel it down there, so get back on the ball. Now, you can do what you want. But it's just that simple. I bake a lot of cakes from scratch. If you don't have the scratch, you can't bake. But if you got the scratch, and you're too lazy to bake, won't do you any good. Some people have every excuse. <clears throat> this word Brother Branham said is either our life or it's not, and this church will go ahead with the understanding Brother Branham gave it, or it's going to go back with the understanding Brother Branham gave it. And he said, I'm afraid you're going to be careless, there's going to be too many things get in your way. And I find that myself to an overbearing degree. <clears throat> you find it that way too. But I'm going to tell you something. That's that thing that we might think is a sacrifice to put ourselves in this position of the word <coughs> becomes the great fruit we're looking for and the great power. I mean, let's go on. Brother Branham categorically said that Matthew 24, 27 was for this hour, which was the light from the east to the west. <clears throat> we have it. <clears throat> I want to ask you a question. Is there any other light? And the answer is no, because he is the light of the world. He said, I am the light of the world. And he's the light of light. And you know, light does have light. It gives a light. <clears throat> that light has given us the light today. And we're walking in the same light. In fact, we have a better light today than they had back there, even though we might not want to admit it. Everybody wants to think, oh, if I could only get back, we would really be something. You are already back. Mm -hmm. yeah. <clears throat> You're already back. St. Killer Fire brought the word as hearing healing word. <clears throat> brought us plumb up to the presence of Almighty God. You can't get by that. <clears throat> See? Now, his spirit light floods the pyramidal city. Like Peter and John, notice, like Peter and John up on the top of the mountain. The light covered the top of the mountain, and the voice said, This is my beloved son. In Revelation 21, 3 and 4, it says, The tabernacle of God is with men. Well, that's what it says, so let's take a look at it. <clears throat> I heard a great voice out there saying, Go, the tabernacle of God is with men. And he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and, and be their God. Well, I want to ask you a question. What does that really mean? Does it mean now that God's here, we're not his people? Don't be silly. He's here in the midst of rot and filth and everything else. Mm -hmm. The same one in human flesh that walked among the scabby and scurvy Pharisees is the same one that's walking amidst the Pentecostal chaff mm -hmm. and the harlotry of all churches, the pride, the ignorance, the filth. <clears throat> but it's the same one and it's the same people from all ages born again are going to be there. And we're right down again where the scribes and the Pharisees were. And where Jesus could even turn to the disciples and say, you're all clean but one of you, because I know one of you isn't clean. Now, we're not trying to get down to numbers in this church. I'm just making a reference to the fact that the clean was with the unclean, and he was right there, and they were all anointed. But only 12, only 11 made it. The one didn't make it. <clears throat> That's all I'm doing is illustrating. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there'll be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying, any more pain, for the former things are passed away. <clears throat> now at this point, they're in the last stage of passing away. Because it's the same God bringing all things to perfection. See? 
All right. Be present. Now, 278. This is very good. God is going to redeem the earth and tabernacle in the earth with his subjects of the earth, which he brought forth from the earth. <clears throat> well, you'll notice that this is the first resurrection. That's why Paul wanted to be in it. Because they're the only ones of the earth that's sanctified by the blood and truly redeemed and cleansed by the Holy Ghost to come back here. The others won't. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so the one that's here to provide the first resurrection is, is separating them even now and by, the, the, by his own voice, not the shout now, the shout of separation here, but by the voice, he'll separate them, bring them out of the earth. <clears throat> now God is going to redeem the earth and tabernacle in the earth when it's fully redeemed by the fire, all burnt out, all cleansed with his subjects of the earth. That's in the first resurrection, which he brought forth from the earth. See, like he came forth with Jesus in the first part of the, ha the first half of the first resurrection. <clears throat> now, materiality was going to be immortalized. But through sin it fell. He had to let it go on. But now he sent Jesus to redeem the fallen earth, which we are a part of it. There's not a hair of your head <clears throat> that will perish. That is really get lost or annihilated. <clears throat> Jesus said so. He said, I'll raise it up again at the last day. That's the day. Okay. See, why? Because you're a part of the earth. In other words, materiality immortalized. That was his plan. He's going to do it. <clears throat> See? Now, the earth was utilized to manifest light. The earth was utilized. Animals came out of it. We came out of it. But notice, we were there before we came out of it. The animals were there before they came out of it. The utilization is always as it is. It's a veil that hides the life and yet reveals the life. Okay? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> now, you're a part of the earth. You notice, I had a little joke about my wife telling me I lost my hair. I told her I hadn't lost one of them. She said, well, pray tell me where they're at. I said, at, at where they were before I got them. Wherever they were as a substance, and wherever they are now, they're waiting for me. See? That's right. I'll go to them one day. <clears throat> now, the substance or form changes according to the stage or the condition of life. However, it will come back here at the time that the life requires it again, and it will be in the right form for that time. Now, we got the right fresh for this time, whether you want to know it or not. She said, ooh, somebody made a mistake. No, nobody made a mistake. I'm with you. I, I just don't, I just don't like the thought of this is it. Well, it's not it. This is temporary. See? <clears throat> But this is a tremendous expression. Wherever they were as a substance, wherever they are now, they're waiting for me. That's true. And I'll go to them one day. Now, the life will form the proper substance <clears throat> uh, from the elements according to the purpose of God. Three. This whole body, wrinkling and falling and dwindling away, that's bending over and falling down, <clears throat> shoulders, aching in knees, horse to throat, that's all right. You can bury the sea, but the trumpet, that's 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, will know it's me when she rings out. Now, you know he said, but the trumpet will know it's me. So he's talking about a literalization of the fact of <clears throat> putting this into a form like it's a man or God himself doing it. Yes, sir. We're going to change one of these days. I'm part of this world that's redeemed. Now, that's a beautiful statement. <clears throat> that is a vindication theorem statement. We today, with Brother Branham, are a part of the world that's redeemed. See? You're in the world, but have nothing to do with the cosmos order of the earth. You're in a different order, a redeemed order. 
<clears throat> so therefore, in the redeemed order, the laws of God apply to the redeemed order where they wouldn't apply to the non-redeemed order. <clears throat> See? But it's the same God. Redeemed order. In other words, this is another vindicated basic principle. The vindication theorem says you are ever in the redeemed order. And you're in the redeemed order now because you're a hair breadth away from being immortal. <clears throat> okay. Notice, the tabernacle of God will be with men. <clears throat> now the tabernacle unveiled is with us. And it's getting us ready for resurrection. Now remember, not a part of the redeemed <clears throat> gets annihilated. It all gets restored. Now we just go to John 17 here. <clears throat> Uh, finally come my way back to it. In the 14th verse, it says, I've given them thy word, and the world hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Well, the world is not, they're, 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 these people are going to get blessed, and others won't. And then in 16, it says, they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Then he says, sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. Now, sanctification makes a separation. <clears throat> now, you notice the word will, number one, separate them and divide them. Then the same word will separate and divide again, and in the division, put God's mark upon them so they fall in the category of the entire redemption. The others cannot. See, the word puts them in or puts them out. <clears throat> Notice again, 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter. <clears throat> And in verse 47, I suppose we could read more, but I won't read more. It says, the last man, the first man is the earth earthy, the second man <coughs> is the Lord from heaven. <coughs> in there, we see that you're going to have a second portion dealt to you as an individual man. Mm -hmm. And as you're looking to come back to your original state with God, which you were in the beginning, without form, except just to see thought. <clears throat> now you're going to have the form that caused you all the trouble taken away and changed to a glorified one. Notice the former things have passed away. This thing has passed away. That's his earth. This means that heaven has come on down to reside with men. The old cosmos system, the whole thing's gone. Heaven and earth are embraced just exactly as when the dove came down upon that part of the earth which was Jesus. See? Heaven and earth embraced. He was the dust of the earth man. God coming from that one little life germ by creative power. The life that was in that blood <clears throat> ascended back to God, but the blood dripped upon the earth to cleanse it, claim it, because the blood that was brought through because of the blood that was brought through from the germ cell <clears throat> from Cain. I see here. What he's talking about here, the blood dripped upon the earth in order to claim it. Because, because of the blood that was brought through from the germ cell from Cain. Now he's telling you that, that, that the, the life of Cain began getting a, a wrapping around it, began getting lots of flesh around it. And that broke the entire bloodline of Adam and, and the, and the uh, children of, of true children of God. This whole thing is messed up now. <clears throat> so God has to bring a re redeeming factor into into uh, into into play. So looking at the Satan sentence here, God coming from that one little light germ by creative power. Now he's not saying God is creating God. That's ridiculous because God's already created. No, he, he, he's non-creative. He, he's just God. You can't say anything. The fact he's eternal, just let it be there. Now, what he's saying here, that one drop of life, which was purely God, manifested, <clears throat> one, one, drop, one drop of this life, he said, one little life germ, you couldn't see it from without a microscope, that one drop of life was purely God, and is manifested God in flesh perfectly. In other words, the one little drop of life that took upon a human form, absolutely, perfectly manifested God. God needed nothing else. 
All he did was prove who he was. He needed nothing else. He just proved who he was. And that might have been it. He did the proving. Jesus said, it is my Father in me doing the works. Now, <clears throat> if it was God <clears throat> or purity God, that little light now there, if it was purely God, then we don't divide him into God and man or spirit and flesh and try to allocate one to the other. <clears throat> Say now, this is flesh and this is spirit. No, because... If it is God-like, it's going to have the body that is required and in the genetic pattern that's in that light. <clears throat> so, any more than you could separate a bird from being the bird, neither can you separate this. What you're looking at is God in the form of a man. So that's what you got to see. Now remember, the germ was the full attributes of God to make a body. Now, he was purely God as to his flesh. For the life formed and lived by the flesh <clears throat> and his desires in that flesh would be God's desires because the flesh is the vehicle of the life, and the life controls the vehicle. <clears throat> so, I want to look at it this way. He that has seen me has seen the Father, period. And I'm looking at it. And every wave or vibration or desire that was in God, was in that body, manifesting itself. I don't want to see a man and see God. I don't want to take part and say, well, now, I'm going to look at this as man. And you can do it. Brother Branham did it. When he cried, that was man. Where did he get his life? That wasn't man life. That was God life. God cried in human form. He wasn't a man that said, come forth, <clears throat> and Lazarus came forth. And if it wasn't, who did it? Mm -hmm. See, I'm, I'm, there is a separation. Understand, he was more than a man. He was God. I understand that. I understand that perfectly. <clears throat> but I'm trying to show you right now that we're talking about a life. And you can do what you want about it, but you get the cell of a dog it's going to bring forth dogs. It won't bring forth cats. The human life will do the same thing. Now, I know they're using genetic splicing, so pretty soon they'll take a they'll take a bit of a bird with a bit of a plum tree or something and try to get a, a plum bird, <coughs> a bird plum or something. They'll do something. God doesn't stop. <coughs> but I'm not worried about those guys. I'm not interested. I'm not at all concerned what they do. I'm trying to get a picture here to show you what I'm looking at and that is that Jesus was God manifest in flesh from the very inception and became truly God in flesh when God himself stepped in there. But it was the life of God that was in that little egg and sperm, not any other life. <clears throat> because Brother Branham did not say he created the life. He said he created the egg and the sperm. <clears throat> so what you see was an actual human being brought forth, an actual God brought forth human-wise in a, in, a, in a vessel, <clears throat> in an incubator. Now, what I'm looking at is this. We're seeing God in human form. Literally, God. The life that was there. A vessel that God himself could plump in, come into. Now, this man, because he's a man, he was tempted in all points like as we. He could love and he could marry. So does God. He loves and he marries. The Bible says so. 
<clears throat> so, as I see what I'm looking at tonight then, I'm understanding what Brother Branham said. The life that was in the blood went back to God. I came from God and I go to God. And the blood was shed upon the earth. And the blood sanctified. It made a way so the life could come back in you and me temporarily. Bring that life down amongst us. Then glorify us and take us away. <clears throat> All of this was done in that particular way. This is how God could be God and have a son. And he would be the son of God and he would be a God. Because seed must bring forth light. Chicken bring forth chicken. Dog bring forth dogs. Human bring forth human. God would have to bring forth God. <clears throat> have to do it. That's why you could look at a prophet. God and the prophet makes him God to the people. Now let's get some scripture here. <clears throat> Maybe I can look at this thing a little closer <clears throat> to see what I'm getting at here. In other words, I simply am not going to be putting distance between God the Father and his own son. I'm not going to do it because the life is there. And that, that, when I did it, well, I foolishly make, make it Jesus only. I'm not that kind of a person. <clears throat> All right, six and Matthew 6 and 22. <clears throat> Just what I want here to see. All right, the light of the body is the eye. Therefore, thine eye be single, thy whole body be full of light. I want to ask you, did Jesus Christ have any deviation of God in him, or was he purely God? <clears throat> I don't care about the body. Mm -hmm. I'm not interested. Right. <clears throat> because that was the temple. Then he says over, he said right on down here in 24, no man can serve two masters. He'll hate one and love the other. He'll hold to one and despise him. You cannot serve God and mammon. Did he have two fathers? Was he, was he of two brands? What was it anyway? In 25, therefore I said, you take no thought for your life, what you eat, what you drink. And yet for the body, what you put on is not the life more than meat, the body more than raiment. Now he's, now he's making a suggestion right there and showing you <clears throat> that the life is apart from it all. <clears throat> now, when did Jesus ever serve two masters? He, never, he said, I've got no part of Satan. Satan's got no part of me. He was perfectly one with God. Now, you go into Philippians, you'll see the same thing that Brother Branham said there. <clears throat> he changed his form. He said, let this mind be also in Christ. Philippians 2 and 5. Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbed equal with God, a prize to grasp and retain. In other words, <clears throat> in a complete spirit form. But he made himself an orbitation. He changed his form. It's the same one all the time. He just changed his form. And it was in that form that he was able to die. <clears throat> because after all, when God Almighty gave that one his life, in the, in the little egg and little sperm, brought him in, the, in the Mary's womb, and brought forth the son, he had to himself later on come in. The father moved right into the son. But remember, God is spirit, and he had a son. And God changed his form. Left the pillar of fire, <clears throat> at the angelic form, the archangel, different things like that, came right down <clears throat> and, and indwelt the son. And by the son, he completely manifested himself. See, now there, there, there's some mysteries involved in there, but I like to keep it as close as I possibly can. Let's go to 1 Peter, the third chapter, <clears throat> the 18th verse. For Christ also once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Now, what was quickened by the Spirit? The flesh was. Mm -hmm. The Spirit wasn't quickened by the Spirit. You're, you and I get our souls quickened by God. <clears throat> this one didn't have to have that. See? What was it got quickened? The flesh got quickened. The flesh was raised up completely. Now, we are sons of God. And we strive to give him the preeminence. That's what we're looking at here. <clears throat> but how successful we are is that we raise to be seen. So we see here that God, coming from that one little light germ by creative power. In other words, God, he's talking about uh, Revelation chapter 3 and verse 14, <clears throat> where he calls himself the beginning of the creation of God. God forming himself into a human being. <clears throat> that light. It created that little, that, that was in that, in that egg and sperm. <clears throat> it went back to God. Remember, God himself had gone back from Christ in the Garden of Eden. I beg your pardon, Gethsemane, Brother Branham taught us that. <clears throat> All right. 
The body was certainly human. The life was certainly God life, pure and simple. See, that's what you're looking at. <clears throat> but therefore, remember, the body was what? It was a complete image or the manifestation of God. It was God's veil. And remember, nothing else could have come out of that life but that figure. Yeah, nothing right. else could have. So that's what I say. When you look at that, you're looking at God. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> he didn't see me as seeing the Father. Because it's, it's, because it's all of God. Now, 282. He comes back with your creative power just like he did Adam, creating Adam. Here is the second Adam. <clears throat> now, um, notice. Let's read it again. Now, he comes back with the creative power, just like he did Adam, creating Adam. Here is the second Adam. Now, <clears throat> he's still talking about New Jerusalem. And he's talking about the ground or the earth being redeemed and completely restored. So, therefore, he is talking about 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter. <clears throat> now, if he's not, I'm telling you something that I shouldn't be telling you. But here's what I see here. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians 15. And uh, <clears throat> you can read 35. You can, but some man will say, how are they doing? How much, how much time we got left, Joe? All right. How are the dead raised up? What body will they come? Thou fool that thou, that which thou sowest is not quickened except it die. He's talking about a piece of, like a grain of wheat or oats. That which thou sowest Thou sowest not that body that shall be. You don't sow the entire body of the grain, the stalk, the leaf, and everything else. You just sow a tiny grain. And it'll bring forth what it's supposed to bring forth because of the genetic pattern that lies in it that was given by God. And the body that's in there is pleasing to God. Now remember, everything that's not pleasing to God gets burnt right up. You better get a body that's going to please God, because these bodies don't necessarily please God. <clears throat> now, they please God in that that's the way God wanted it. But they don't please God in the way that they're doing now. So he will give the body back from the seed. The seed will bring to itself the glorified constituents. That's what it says. All flesh is not the same flesh. as one flesh of men, beasts, and birds, and so on, and bodies, terrestrials, and the glory of the sun, the glory of the moon, and stars, and different things, so is the resurrection of the dead. It is so in corruption, raised in corruption, so in dishonor, raised in glory, so in weakness, raised in power, so in a natural body, raised in spiritual body. <clears throat> what does it? The seed. The seed demands a figure. It demands a veil. <clears throat> it demands a manifestation. That's what it does. Now it's raised, in, it's raised in spirit body. There's a natural body, there's a spirit body. <clears throat> As it's written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul, the last Adam, a quickening spirit. Now, Brother Branham, going back to Genesis, is quoting the making and the creation of Adam. And now he says the resurrection is going to make a second Adam. I never thought of it that way, but never did think that. <clears throat> I always thought that <clears throat> Jesus was the second Adam, like all theologians. Now, whether Brother Branham is bringing out a theology here, uh, some theology <clears throat> is beyond me. But I like it. I like what he's saying. It's, it's, it's very good. Because he is actually creating Adam again. Every single one. He said he'll, not, he'll create not by sex and marriage and divorce, but he said he'll by creative act. He'll take the the potassium and the calcium and the, <clears throat> he said, the minerals, cosmic light, all of those things, bring them right together, and he'll make a body. And he used the word cosmic light, and I think on the idea that the light is going to emanate from us or it's going to motivate us. It's not going to be sexual life as it comes through the blood because there's no blood. <clears throat> there be no blood. What all it means, I don't know. But I like the thought here, this is the second Adam. He's going to do it again. Mm -hmm. And through that breaking cell, there were sin. Cain broke that blood cell of the just. See, now this blood cell, because he killed Abel, but Abel was born sex. But this one wasn't born sex. It was a creation of God, the beginning of it. <clears throat> I'm just telling you here how the blood was shed at Abel. It couldn't do the job. It was born by sex. 
This one could do the job because it wasn't born by sex. This was a creative act. See? Now, you'll notice again that Freud is coming back into preeminence. Books being written on him, <coughs> what have you. And Freud did not postulate, as many say he did, that sex was the root and the cause of all drive and all problems. Aggression and some of these other things he put there too. But, but there is no doubt that Freud was right on being with the scripture as a psychoanalyst. But he couldn't get his wire straightened because he couldn't have a revelation. All he could do was do his best. <clears throat> he was no doubt the great brain of the century when it comes to psychoanalysis. <clears throat> and I'm afraid that the people have deviated from him by going to drugs and those things which are not very valuable but very, very poor. But anyway, just a thought there that these, the, 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 the great thinkers can understand some of these things where the, these poor little pinheaded theologians never got off the ground. I mean, they're, they're just too ridiculous. Bet you the Pentecostals, my, they are the crummiest of all, I should tell you the truth. And I've been a Pentecostal for many years, I should be honest with you, they are the worst of the worst. <coughs> they're, 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 they're worse than the Methodists, and God knows they're horrible. <coughs> they're about the corniest of all. You take an Armenian, he's gone. That's where the Catholic Church went down the drain. They couldn't believe Augustine was right. Augustine was not much of a man. He turned down the Holy Ghost. <coughs> but they, but they, they lost the they lost complete understanding of of the of the of, the, of, of Godhead sovereignty. And then they got then they got the stupidity to put the Pope as though he's got some big brains or something. Every time you deny sovereignty, you watch man get swell headed. They haven't written a book that stood the test of time. Not one Armenian ever wrote one book that stood the test of time. Not one. Not one ever mounted. it. You want to study the great men of this world? Go back all the time. The men, the men that understood the sovereignty of God. <coughs> Paul, William Brandt, Moses. You can't, you can't find it. You can't find it. Brother, you simply can't find it. Except the man was a prophet, and the prophet taught the man. He just can't do it. These people are all mixed up here. They can't see this. They don't understand serpents. They don't understand any of these things. See? But God has a redeemed earth away from man. Man hasn't got a thing to do with it. You take the potash, the petroleum, cosmic light, they made it, and it's already not one hair could be harmed. I'll raise it up for the last day. Then what? Okay, we're going to call it right there. <coughs> I'm going to let you get over it, but I'm sorry I didn't do it. <coughs> but here's what we're looking at. It's right in front of us. Not something way, way down the road. <coughs> People often wonder how the early church could live in that spirit. You know why? They had the fullness of it. Mm -hmm. This is the first time we got it back. Amen. But now it's the Omega part. You watch, you see what happens. You sit here, you say, I don't believe it. You're, you'll find out. You don't, somebody, somebody's going to get it. Sure as I stand, I know I'm telling you the truth. I don't care anybody says there's no way. I mean, you can't prove a different brother sister. I don't care if science does. It just shows the serpent seed is right and everything the prophet said is right. God's got a pure string, brother sister, like the last one was no wit in that ark. There's a pure string in the Holy Ghost of this earth that's going to make it. Let's try to <coughs> Heavenly Father, we pray you'll go with us as we go to our homes. May we have peace, rest, and consolation in our souls. And may we, Lord God, from this time on, and we know it's up to us to do it, Lord, you're not going to take a brick and hit us, that we can extend the olive branch. We can take a leaf off the tree of life. We can take a word that has been absolutely vindicated and extend it to our brothers and sisters and walk in the light as you're in the light, have fellowship and peace like a river can flow, O God, and we can have a harmonious, spirit-filled church to the point where the sick amongst us are healed and the glory of God is manifested. Yeah. Father, we don't want to go down the road looking at somebody else's church. We don't want to hang back. We want to stand right here in the groove where the prophet put us. And Lord, we've been standing here for the last 25 years that were, and we've got to keep standing. We'll stand, just keep looking at what is ours because we know that time is finished. There is a bride that's eternal already, always has been, and now the hour of immortality is right here, and then that means, Lord, the whole thing is in complete balance. It's right in turn with you. 
<clears throat> Father, may your people be lifted up tonight. May they get their eyes upon this. And from this time on, Lord, begin to be kinder and sweeter, more loving, more gentle, more knowing, just more, more what they really are, priests and kings unto God, with all the glory poured out to you, Lord, and everybody with a welcoming spirit, because that's what it's all about. And here we are living in a world where it's already forming, where it could never form before. Father, if this being the case, what a bride there is reserved for the end time, as the prophet said, this is the age I would pick. And now we begin to see why he said it. So, Father, we just thank you for this wonderful, glorious opportunity of being a part of it. May we just love as we've never loved before now, with every barrier, every boundary down, and every one extending love. Little rivers, each one, flowing in one beautiful river until one day it floats its plumb across. Now unto the King, eternal, immortal, Israel, the only wise God, be all power and honor and glory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And amen.